Welcome to Alchemical Science. I'm Jordan, an open source researcher who investigates ideas that are either usually very old, very new, or very esoteric. So I had a number of people reach out to me about doing a condensed breakdown of Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project's recent video of a presentation by a Russian plasma physicist titled The Problem of Ball Lightning and Its Connection with the Problem of Cold Nuclear Fusion, a presentation in Russian by Anatoly Nikitin. So it's a very long video and it's all in Russian, uh, but it presents Anatoly Nikitin's proposed model for ball lightning based on his extensive observations and decades of experience in ball lightning research. Anyway, I've decided to make this video to just help give a simpler and broader overview of the concepts Anatoly brings up in his presentation and to go through a number of the different examples of ball lightning phenomena that he presents, uh, his observations of which have been incorporated into his ball lightning model. And at the end of the video, I've also included the slides of the maths and chemistry behind Anatoly Nikitin's model, uh, which are explained at more length uh, with a somewhat garbled translation, unfortunately, because uh, it's automatically done uh, in the original video from Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. But as per usual on this channel, uh, we're just going to keep the focus of this overview video on the simple and comprehensible form and function um, of what's happening wherever possible. So we're going to deal with the simple stuff and I'm also going to give you the more complex stuff if you'd like to go and explore it further, but um, the original video is for that. So remember you can go and check out the full original video over there on uh, Martin Flashman Memorial Project YouTube channel and I highly encourage you to uh, go and do that and um, also if you want to help out Bob Grainier, uh, keep doing the good that he does then you can reach out and donate to the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project to help continue the free sharing of important knowledge. And I'm not affiliated. I've just been covering a lot of Bob's work and I really appreciate what he and the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project are doing. So I just want to give them a plug there and let you know who's uh, giving us this information. So first, just a little bit about Anatoly Nikitin, uh, the presenter of this presentation. He's a member of the Institute of Energy Problems of Chemistry uh, and author on the subject of ball lightning. He graduated from the physics department of the University of Moscow in plasma physics before beginning his career in plasma uh, at a laboratory working on hydrogen related technology. And he then worked on chemical lasers in Finland uh, where they made some new novel fusion reaction discoveries, but they weren't allowed to publish their findings apparently. Um, he then moved on to work at the Institute of Chemical Physics, uh, which had a merger and a name change at some point, if that's of relevance to you. Uh, Anatoly Nikitin began to attend conferences about cold fusion, and this led him to forming his own hypothesis around what he referred to as the reverse Varus effect. Uh, and the Varus effect, it's not a term that I'd heard before, uh, but Anatoly says that this is when a gamma ray is emitted from the nucleus of a crystal, transferring the energy of the motion in the nucleus into vibration in the crystal. And his idea was that he could reverse the Varus effect if he hit a crystal with a titanium, a titanium hammer saturated with hydrogen uh, to accelerate the nucleus with great speed. And apparently this work was stalled, um, but by the mid-90s Anatoly began to focus more and more on ball lightning. And it wasn't until recent years, however, that he realized the true extent of the connection between cold fusion and ball lightning phenomena. He realized cold fusion nuclear reactions could be carried out using a ball lightning approach. So the beginning of his presentation is all about examples. Um, and this is what we're going to focus on in this video, because it's, it's very clear, very understand, uh, easy to understand. And then the model presented afterwards is um, what he's built. Uh, from his observations in the long term and his practical experiments synthesizing ball lightning. So that's where we're going to start out, some examples of ball lightning, and this is very interesting stuff. So just in this first image, we just see a type of ball lightning. Uh, we see it has a luminous shell and a luminous core, and you can go and explore some of Bob's other videos, um, his analysis of ball lightning, and you'll find a ton of other experiments showing a very similar structure um, as Anatoly describes here and shows. 
So Anatoly himself first started paying attention to ball lightning when he was just 10 years old. Uh, he cited the phenomena near his house when he was a boy, and it's become a mystery he'd, he'd wished to solve since. So just a bit of background there. So in this long exposure image, uh, this was taken by an Australian photographer, apparently. I'm not sure who, but if you do know, uh, let me know in the comments and I'll credit them or that article so we can look into it further. But linear lightning struck several times while the camera lens was open and the ball lightning structures we see in the image formed during the discharge and flew out. And again, I haven't heard this story myself and I'm an Australian, so I'm interested if anyone has any further source for information on this event. Um, but Anatoly says that witnesses in the town where this happened saw a very large ball lightning structure form which came down and bounced around on the ground, gradually shrinking in size. It apparently caused some wreckage in this process, uh, scattering nearby objects, including a car. In this next image, Anatoly shows a, another example of ball lightning occurring during a discharge of linear lightning captured on camera in two men. Uh, unfortunately, the link shown here no longer works. So uh, again, let me know if you have a working link to that video, if you can identify it from the photo in the comments. However, he does provide us with another image, which shows us four frames of the event. Image A just shows the sky before the lightning occurrence. In image B, we see a flash of lightning a second later. In image C, we see the appearance of ball lightning um, after just one thirtieth of a second. And finally, in image D, we see the position that the ball lightning had moved to just after 12 seconds. So it had travels, traveled some way across the sky and gone up into the clouds. And it's only comments here that ball lightning can be formed without any visible material um, or from air, water, or fields of some kind. And also says that it's significant to note here how quickly the ball lightning is formed. This footage shows that it took less than 1 30th of a second, uh, which means that they're formed almost instantaneously. Ball lightning can also be formed in other ways, um, according to dozens of observations. And next, Anatoly shows us ball lightning of a second variety, uh, which often form at high altitudes in the vicinity of a high-powered energy source. And this type of formed more slowly, um, with multiple luminous bundles uniting into a larger luminous ball lightning structure. And we know that ball lightning phenomena are multifaceted and there are multiple ways uh, that they can form and exhibit behavior. So at this point, Anatoly mentions that recently himself and his colleagues conducted a successful experiment directing ionic discharge at a charged plate where they observed charged ball lightning flying out, uh, bouncing around and eventually exploding or bursting. And he confirmed that they've been successful in synthetically producing ball lightning. So I quote, it's already there. Uh, now we're moving on. In other words, at this point, they've moved past the point of proving the phenomena can be reliably synthetically produced and now are now conducting deeper investigations into the nature of ball lightning and improving upon their model. And this is a famous photograph taken in the 60s uh, in Australia again by a Russian this time I gather uh, from the conversation, although the translation's a little hard to decipher at this point. Um, we see the ball lightning flash and explode at the bottom after pausing at several points where it fell. And I found it too difficult to decipher the almost gibberish English translation from this part of the video, at least in my transcript. But according to the text on the image, ball lightning descends, moving in the direction of the cloud's electric field vector. Several times the fall is stopped due to the action of the oscillating electric field of a linear lightning discharge. He concludes that ball lightning has a positive electrical charge. This next slide shows an analysis of the ball lightning event in the video taken uh, with a frame rate of 1 30th of a second earlier. So I'm guessing this is an analysis of the frames from the footage uh, shown in the earlier slide from two men with the four frames, but he isn't that clear here. I'm reasonably sure. Uh, so Anatoly apparently contacted the media after this event, and they reported that they saw two ball lightning structures form. The other one stopped shining for three seconds and then reappeared. And Anatoly stresses here uh, that this shows us that this is nothing like the simple chemical process of a candle burning. Uh, it's a more complex process. Ball lightning that's not visible can suddenly appear out of nowhere. Uh, it's almost like they can turn off and on again or become, become spontaneously invisible. After a ball lightning flash, uh, before it disappears, ball lightning's been observed to either 
quietly dissolve, uh, collapse into nothing, or alternatively explode. So these images show a ball landing structure flashing brightly, but rather than exploding, uh, returning to somewhere around its original size. And as Oli says that it's been proven that it's emitting electromagnetic radiation, or RF radiation, in addition to the light before disappearing. And just a little note from myself here, um, I've made my case before, and I'll make it again here, that differentiating between something like EMR and radio frequency um, seems counterproductive to me at this point. We compartmentalize our terminology too much, uh, and we give it too many different names depending on the field of science we're studying, or, you know, in the marginally different forms it takes. Um, but these emissions are all fundamentally the same phenomena, uh, and I encourage people to look at Ken Wheeler's videos on uncovering the missing secrets of magnetism uh, for what I believe is probably the most concise elucidation on that topic. But back to the presentation. Uh, this was a photo taken of the scar around a man's neck. Um, ball lightning of around 10 centimeters in size appeared around a meter and a half from the man and it exploded, melting and vaporizing the gold chain around his neck. But we can see that the man got out undamaged aside from this scarring. They calculated that the mass of the chain and the power required to vaporize it um, would be no less than 200 kilowatts. So a lot of power. Anatoly concludes that this structure had a lot of energy uh, and it was likely formed at a high altitude and then fed and grew larger as it descended uh, according to his previous observations. So this next photo was taken by a husband and wife in Hungary when they noticed a glowing light that had uh, fallen on the snow in their garden. And a few seconds later, it disappeared. Uh, however, they didn't report how it disappeared, uh, whether it flew away or it collapsed or something else. Uh, the couple thought that they'd find something hot lying in the snow, obviously, like a piece of metal or something. Uh, but there was no trace of any object found and the snow wasn't melted around the area. So Anatoly suggests that the reason for this is that the, that the RF emission uh, generated by the ball lining isn't absorbed by the snow. He provides evidence for this idea by the experiment shown on the screen. A box of snow was placed inside a microwave with a power of 850 watts for 30 seconds. The snow didn't melt. Uh, a microwave oven operates at a wavelength of 12.25 centimeters, and ball lightning is likely to radiate in the range of 1 to 10 centimeters, according to uh, his observations. A simple way I like to think about things like this, uh, me personally interjecting again here, uh, is just to think of a tuning fork or a Tesla coil. If the two coils or the two forks are tuned to the same frequency, then they'll resonate sympathetically when one is struck. And if they're tuned to a different frequency, uh, different frequencies that are further apart, uh, then that aren't an octave or a harmonic of each other, when one fork or a coil is struck, then the other won't resonate. Uh, there'll be no induction, no sympathetic resonance. Um, to cause the second fork or the coil to resonate, uh, melt, or be otherwise affected. All right, Anatoly gives another example of ball lightning being spotted, this time in London, which was apparently reported in the Daily Mail. And once again, if you happen to have the source for this article, an old cutout or something, um, please share it in the comments or a link to it. So a man saw a ball of lightning fall into a barrel that stood under his window. Uh, he ran out to check for a cannonball or some kind of object again in the barrel, but he found that the instead that the 18 liters of water that was in the barrel had boiled away. And we can see the energy density required to boil away 18 liters of water uh, displayed here on the slide. And after this case, a number of other cases of ball lightning falling into a vessel of liquid were reported. Uh, which confirmed the high specific energy content of ball lining again. So it's also apparent from these reports that ball lining is capable of transferring energy to water. Uh, remember that the snow in the earlier example had remained unmelted and undisturbed, so this is all in pretty interesting stuff. Anatoly also briefly mentions uh, some further response and discussion about this and something about frogs being boiled in a pond somewhere. But the English transcript I had was really a bit rough here, so I, th I think we got the core of it. Ball lining is capable of boi boiling water, uh, while not boiling snow, at least in some scenarios. Melting snow, I should say. I guess it could boil, eventually. Uh, next we see the, an image of a ball lining explosion that occurred inside a wooden house uh, during a large thunderstorm. And Anatoly notes that the slate sheets on the roof were torn out with the nails, 
uh, but the, the sheets were not themselves shredded or you know they, they weren't damaged. They remained intact and they just slipped off. Uh, so it's quite an unusual explosion. We see another photo of a ball lining explosion in a wooden house, which blew out the wall here. And he says that these cases are fairly common in wooden houses uh, and they happen and get reported on about once a year. So another example here, uh, which is really clear, in this case, the ball lining exploded and blew out part of the wall. And it appears that the wall was torn apart at the weakest point. And Anatoly says here that in both this and the previous photo, there were people present in the houses uh, at the time that witnessed the ball lining explosion. And uh, in one case, a hostess was just doing dishes in the room when it occurred, and she lost her hearing for a while, uh, and it didn't come right for several months. So we see that there was no splinters or shrapnel, really. Uh, in other words, it's not a normal explosion, which is what he's showing here. This is a ball lining event. So Anatoly points out that, again, uh, the wall's not destroyed. It's just smoothly shifted in that way. Um, he says that a possible reason for the destruction of the houses is due to the repulsion of a charge of ball lining deposited on, uh, deposited on the walls of the rooms. Uh, and his calculations confirm this idea for him. So next we have a photo of a tree trunk where ball lining has torn a strip of bark from it, uh, as shown here. And calculations show that this can be explained by the boiling of the juice, uh, of the sap, I guess, under the influence of the RF radiation from the ball lining. For again here, uh, we see that the nylon rope, which was present when it happened, uh, where the hammock was hung, it wasn't melted or disturbed at all. So this tells us that ball lining isn't itself hot, uh, although it can boil liquids. So water can absorb RF radiation. This is not a mechanical process occurring, uh, and Anatoly says that this is typical of previous observations of ball lining. And again, just to interject myself again quickly here, I feel this is still a slightly compartmentalized way of explaining how everything works through resonance. Uh, as Malcolm Bendel's PUM claims, we could view absolutely everything as a form of AC field with a frequency, so on all fractal scales. And with this simple rule, we can understand that all matters of energy, force, and power can be un understood uh, in terms of frequency. So if two things share the same natural resonant wave band, so to speak, uh, sympathetic resonance can occur. So depending on the amplitude of the sympathetic resonance, an object can be caused to shift, soften, melt, boil, or be otherwise manipulated, for example, levitated. Anyway, next slide. Here we see an example of a hole cutting glass um, by ball lightning. Generally, these holes have a diameter of anywhere from 5 to 30 centimeters, and often no cracks appear in the surrounding glass. These samples are apparently available at the Institute of Energy Problems of Chemistry. And once again, Anatoly says this phenomena occurs due to the rapid volumetric heating of glass by high-frequency radiation from ball lightning. And here we see an image from an experiment showing this phenomena. And next, Anatoly goes through some other case examples which demonstrate further how ball lightning can behave. So I'll just read out these slides he provides here, uh, the case examples. So, uh, one, ball lightning approached two young men from above and they felt a weight on their shoulders as if someone had sat on them. Then the pressure changed to the opposite effect. Ball lining began to pull them upward, lifting them off the ground. And this can be explained by the fact that at first that the ball lining transferred part of its charge to the men, and then when the charge drained, it began to attract them due to the polarization of their bodies. And Anatoly notes here that the men felt the pressure when the ball lightning was around five meters or less away from them. In the second case, in the vicinity of a factory near Petrozavodsk, uh, while it was raining, uh, a ball lightning attached to a diesel locomotive uh, and pulled a train of freight cars for an hour with the locomotive engine turned off. And this can be explained by the fact that ball lightning followed a thundercloud uh, flying in the direction that the train was moving. So the ball lightning dragged the train along for an hour, uh, chasing a storm, essentially. So cool, but freaky. And Anatoly says that the engineers tried to press the brakes and turn off the fuel supply, but they were unable to slow down the train. And he notes here that this tells us that although ball lightning is commonly reported as only lasting for 20 seconds or less, 
Uh, here we see it active for an hour, exhibiting powerful force to a drag to train along behind it for this long. So this is another mystery that he says must be solved. In the next example, there are three image frames shown here. Uh, in the first, we see ball lining in front of the car. And in the second, we see the ball lining collide with the car and explode. And in the third, we see the charged particles dispersing and a cloud. And, and the ball lining stops glowing and dissolves. So Anatoly says that this speaks in favor of the fact that ball lining is an object um, that has some kind of charge carriers inside it. And these are the small charges that scatter when the ball lightning shell is destroyed. And so this instance was, again, further confirm, uh, confirmation to how they understood ball lightning to be organized. Anatoly developed this simple spherical ball lightning model shown on the screen here based on his observations. So it shows the accumulation or the gathering of charges, so to speak, um, but with a shell or a force that prevents them from scattering. So he claims that the shell consists of a polarized of polarized water molecules. So now we get into the nitty gritty of maths and chemistry of Anatoly Nikitin's proposed ball lining model. And I'll be the first to admit that I've not studied these topics uh, from a conventional angle. And the information presented here is well above my head uh, to fully understand or utilize in any meaningful way. However, I am aware that many viewers of the channel do have some experience uh, in conventional mathematics and chemistry. So... I wish to include Anatoly Nikodin's equations here for your consideration. And this is also an effort to preserve this information in multiple places. Um, MFMP is an open source project and they encourage us all to back up and preserve their videos and work in various ways. Um, so anyway, you can just pause on the slides if you wish to read through more thoroughly. Unfortunately, there's little point in me trying to give a comprehensible breakdown of Anatoly's further verbal elucidation of the slides um, in my more simple video here, just between my own lack of experience in conventional maths and chemistry and the somewhat garbled English subtitle translation that I have to work with, I don't think I'd really be able to do it justice and I'd rather leave you to hear it directly from the source. So at this point, if you have time, um, patience and knowledge in your field uh, to hear Anatoly's verbal explanation accompanying the slides that may give you some further information and context, then I encourage you to go and watch the full video on the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project channel, which I've linked to in the description. And if not, then uh, I encourage you to stick around or skip to the end of the video to see Anatoly's uh, conclusions.
Thanks for watching. I'll be back with more videos covering the work of Bob Grainier, Malcolm Bendel, and all the rest very soon. And Bob's got some new interesting stuff out already. So if you're subscribed to Martin Flashman Memorial Project, go and have a look over there. Catch you next time. Bye.